So, uh, yeah, I was talking with Alex in the bus last night. I didn't realize it was going to become a public conversation. Um, but, yeah, the truth is I would kind of set myself an audacious task here. I, uh, you know, I, I said I'm going to cover uh, hello? Ah. Uh, three decades of sensor-based robotics research, which is quite a task in 30 minutes. Um, but I feel a lot better now because uh, I listened to John Hollerbach's uh, talk this morning, and he covered 40 years of robotics research in 10 minutes. So clearly it can't be so hard. So uh, I thought I would start by uh, just uh, talking just a bit about my, my personal connection to the Institute. Uh, as some of you know, uh, I spent a year in Germany after my PhD as a Fulbright scholar. I was on the, well, from, from Bavaria's point of view, on the wrong side of the country. I was uh, over in Karlsruhe in Baden-Württemberg. Um, and uh, so uh, after spending a year there, I uh, had the opportunity to come and visit uh, the Institute and to meet Garrett for the first time. And this is uh, in 1989, which, um, as many of you know, is also an eventful year for Germany. It was uh, when the wall uh, separating East and West Germany came down. Um, so I met Gerd, this is really the first time I met him, and I toured the Institute, and of course Rotex was going on at that time, which was a remarkable project, particularly for that era. The, you know, the, the SGI equipment, the simulations, the 3D visualization was just out of this world. Uh, and then I, I went into Gerd's office and we had a discussion, uh, and most of the discussion uh, revolved around, um, not exactly probably this force sensor, but a force sensor. Uh, and we must have spent, I don't know, half an hour or more, and he was telling me about this force sensor, and he was talking about this, uh, this mechatronics idea. Um, I have a PhD in computer science. I, I wasn't even sure I could spell mechatronics, let alone I, I knew what it was. But so he went on about this, and uh, you know, it was an interesting conversation. And uh, I left, and I had a very good impression of the Institute, but I was thinking about the force sensor and this mechatronics, and just thinking, you know, it's just, it's such a small idea. It really can't go anywhere. And of course, uh, 20 years later, I've been proven wrong, uh, I guess more times uh, than I care to count at this point. Uh, it's really remarkable over the 20 year span that I, uh, I've been visiting the Institute to see how it's grown, how it's developed, and how that force sensor became an arm, the arm became uh, an arm and a hand and the arms and hands were attached to a body until now we have this uh, amazing humanoid robot that we've seen. Now, um, my talk today is about perception. Uh, and it, I think it's a very interesting time to be thinking about perception. Uh, uh, in part, it's because of developments like Justin. Uh, you know, the fact is that we have now these remarkable platforms uh, in robotics that we can uh, use to carry out experiments and, and to try out ideas. At the same time, there's been equally remarkable advances in, in computing and AI. So I'm sure many of you remember in 1997, uh, Deep Blue beat uh, Kasparov at chess. Uh, so it was really the first time a, a game-playing computer at a cerebral game like chess had, had beat a human. Um, more recently, last year, uh, Watson, uh, again, uh, it was a, a blue gene computer from IBM, uh, running uh, machine learning algorithms, was trained to play Jeopardy, and it in fact beat the uh, Jeopardy champion. Uh, and most recently, this has even become essentially commercial, so some of you might have the new iPhone 4S. It has a little application called Siri. Uh, it's a question answering system. Again, uh, AI uh, technology, it uh, understands your question or attempts to understand your question, attempts to infer the intent of the question, and then does large scale data mining to try to find the answer that it, it thinks you're looking for. And in fact, that's really what defines both Watson and Siri is the fact that over the last decade, we've created this remarkable repository of knowledge called the World Wide Web. Uh, and these systems are able now to go out and mine and organize that information and connect it with a question that you're trying to solve. So in some sense, if you think of building a robot as being, you know, having a body and a brain, you know, the only thing that's left at this point really are the senses. You know, we need to connect the body and the brain to the real world, and that's what senses do. And so the question is, you know, why aren't the senses there? In fact, uh, Ralph Kupa, uh, in his talk, uh, opined that in some sense, uh, right now, 
senses like computer vision often get in the way. You, know, you can build a robot to be very fast and efficient. It's hard to get perception to actually keep up with it. Um, so why is that? Why is it so hard? And, and you know, where have we been? Where are we going? Will we ever get there? So I guess that's the, really the theme of the rest of my talk, is to just dwell a little bit on, on work that's been done in the area, try to extrapolate a little bit where we might be going. And along the way, uh, see a few of the contributions of the DLR. So um, I think it's important to, to, again, step back a little bit. Uh, we've seen a lot of old pictures uh, in this uh, symposium, so here are a couple of mine. Uh, the top uh, picture is actually from the University of Pennsylvania, probably about 1982 or 1983. I apologize for the quality of the, the photo. It was the best I could do. Um, and I think the, the important thing to realize when you look at this picture is that uh, many of the things that we talk about today were there. So there's a stereo camera system. It's mounted on a pan-tilt head. Uh, on the end of the robot, that long uh, protuberance is actually a tactile sensor. Uh, affectionately known as the French finger at the time. Uh, and of course, we already mentioned the, the force sensor that was uh, developed here at DLR. So all of the sensing ingredients were there. What was missing really at the time was both computing and, in some sense, know-how. For example, that stereo camera. I'm sure many of you know nowadays stereo, if you have a pair of cameras and you want to calibrate it, you pull out a MATLAB toolkit and you're done. At this time, when we wanted to calibrate the camera, there were a set of knobs that we turned, and we would literally bring the cameras into alignment mechanically so that we could do stereo on them. We didn't know how to do uh, camera calibration. Uh, the tactile sensor, I'll just point out, um, the cups bolted to the table. Uh, and in fact, we went through a several cups with that tactile sensor. You had to push so hard on it to get a signal that uh, you really couldn't sense anything realistic. So, uh, another good example of this uh, is actually the predecessor to what Alex saw in uh, robot mapping. So another thing that became available at that time pretty widely uh, was uh, these mobile robot bases. Uh, and they all had these little uh, Polaroid sensors on them, sonar sensors. And so naturally, everybody uh, grabbed onto sonar sensors, and we started to think about how can we do uh, mapping with sonar. Now, uh, it turns out that's a hard problem. To actually understand the physics of sonar and environment uh, is not uh, easy to do. But what it did uh, lead us to do is it led us to start to develop algorithms based on uh, statistics and, and formal ideas of, of optimization to say, well, how can we bring information in and how can we put it into some sort of a, a uniform framework and be able to weigh information uh, in an effective manner. Uh, and so this, obviously, uh, again, for people who've done work in this area, is a uh, common filter-based mapping algorithm. It's actually running from, uh, uh, from sonar, uh, finding uh, essentially points in the world. And this was really introduced by Smith, Self, and Cheeseman uh, in the late 80s. Now, the fact is that, um, although many people tried, trying to do mapping with sonar really never took off. It, it has uh, all sorts of, of issues uh, in terms of actually interpreting the sonar information. But as Alex just showed, uh, there was a real revolution in the, about the mid-90s when suddenly laser scanners became available. And uh, as he very nicely showed, once you had a laser scanner, you're really going from these, these small bits of information that you're trying to somehow combine and imagine a world around it to having dense information where the world is just there in front of you for you to interpret. And in fact, many of these algorithms, which had not worked well uh, for sonar data, as soon as you applied them to laser data, they worked extremely well. And then the field moved very rapidly to first mapping you know, small indoor environments and larger indoor environments. And as you just saw, now you can basically get in your car and drive, uh, and we're able to solve uh, mapping problems. And so this is really a remarkable uh, a set of steps of progress, where we get the right sensor, we find the right algorithms, and suddenly they start to show up everywhere. And in fact, these days, uh, because of that, uh, the sensors have been miniaturized, they have much higher fidelity, and in fact, you're starting to even see them in things like uh, appliances uh, that are for sale uh, commercially. So uh, the, the point I want to make uh, here is that um, there's really a, a notion that you know, in order to do perception, you need two things. You need sensors, 
and you need some way of interpreting the information from that sensor. And people like to say information is the sensors plus the algorithm, and I actually think it's sensors min, or min sensors and algorithms. You can't do any better than the sensors you have, and you can't do any better than the algorithms you have. And you have to have both in place before things can happen. And so laser map or uh, mapping in general is, is a great uh, example of that. And in fact, I think we're going to see similar revolutions uh, in force sensing. We saw some beautiful examples of force sensing in the surgical robot here at the DLR at the demos. Uh, on the bottom is a tactile mosaic that we actually developed in our lab. Tactile sensing is now really at the point that you can do very interesting work with it. I'll show a little bit uh, of object recognition with tactile sensing. And in fact, we saw a skin again at the demos. And uh, you know, range sensing has now really become also very accessible uh, to a wide uh, set of people. So you'll notice um, I skipped vision. So what was going on in vision at this time? Well, kind of a, a similar uh, process in many ways. So I mentioned uh, the camera. We didn't even know how to calibrate a camera in the 1980s. In fact, if one were to look at the 1980s from a computer vision point of view, probably the iconic contribution of that era is really understanding the geometry of multi-camera systems and having a fundamental framework that we could build on. Now, it didn't hurt that Moore's Law was also coming up behind us, and so we happened to gain a lot of computing power during that decade as well. But really, fundamentally, it was understanding the sensors and uh, the algorithms that surround them. Um, now, I, I actually, uh, in, the, in the 90s, I guess kind of moving ahead a decade, uh, did a lot of work in real-time vision. And again, uh, this is an example of something that we really probably could not have done the decade earlier simply because we didn't have the, the computing power. Once we had the computing power, it became very interesting to start to invent algorithms that could solve uh, very interesting types of problems, you know, starting with, with simple face tracking, uh, then going to multi queue tracking, uh, in this case ha using a particle filter, which was the next iteration on the Kalman filter, uh, and then tracking and clutter, actually using some machine learning ideas, and tracking very high degree of freedom systems. And again, this is really all driven by, in this case, the, the, the sensing and hardware being there, allowing us to, to do that algorithmic development. Now, of course, it turns out, uh, I just uh, found out when I was preparing for this talk, we were scooped. Uh, and in fact, Wes Schneider uh, let the cat out of the bag yesterday. So already in 1980, as he told, uh, 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 they had developed an object tracking system uh, for tracking airplanes uh, in the sky, uh, uh, t working together with uh, Garrett and his institute. So um, I guess somehow he, he was already out there ahead of me. I guess it uh, goes to show what Alex said. You want to be careful what area you go into because uh, Gerd Hirtzinger might have been there first. So one of the, the fun things that also um, these visual tracking algorithms let us do is really for the first time, I think, with vision, to start to think about interacting with the world in, a, in a, 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 an interactive physical way. Um, I was just uh, speaking briefly with Garrett before I started talking, and he was uh, mentioning, you know, when he, uh, when he started out, he did a lot of the work himself, and he actually you know, built devices and all this. So uh, I guess I'm the same way. I, I love these slides, mostly because I wrote every line of code myself in the, the tracking side and the visual servoing side. And it was fun, because really you were making a robot do something. You finally could take a robot, you could put a camera on it, and it would do something uh, interesting in the world. And so you know, it was the beginning of really seeing that you know, maybe we're on to something here. And in fact, uh, we had the, the luxury at that time of uh, collaborating again with the DLR. Uh, and so we took some of our feature-based visual servoing work and we actually moved it to the DLR. And in fact, we had a, a student here who was visually servoing satellites for satellite docking at about that time. Now, it doesn't take a, a genius to realize that once you've got these dynamic sensors moving around in the world, you don't have to control an arm. You can put the sensor on something that's moving itself. And suddenly, all of the mapping ideas that uh, you just saw with laser scanning become available now using a simple video camera. And so, in fact, that was another area that originally was developed by uh, Darish Bursko and myself in, in our lab, the VGPS system. 
Uh, and uh, Darius uh, subsequently moved to uh, DOR and Technical University of Munich. And just recently, uh, they brought out uh, this system you see in the upper right. It's a handheld laser scanner. And it's now fully integrating laser scanning with video together with visual mapping. So you're actually getting full real-time 3D uh, registration and reconstruction out of the system. Again, taking algorithms plus now the right sort of sensing and, and computational package, making it possible to, to do this, uh, you know, build this beautiful sensor. All right, so, so you know, where am I going with this? So we, we've kind of started out with sensors and algorithms, and they're kind of developing together. Um, but uh, as fun as it was, one of the, the real issues, uh, or in continuing issues, I think, is uh, this quote by Peter Allen at, at Columbia. We were talking about visual servoing, and I was very excited I could get my robots to do this. Um, but the thing he pointed out, of course, is in order to get the, the robot to do it, I basically picked the features, I wrote the algorithms. It was all pretty much hardwired. And it was really my visual system that was solving most of the vision problem, deciding what it should do, not the, the computer. And so hence this quote, uh, the problem with vision-based control isn't the control, it's the vision. So even though we're doing all these wonderful things with vision, we're not really solving the vision problem. The system's not recognizing what's going on. And so that brings us to the, the current decade, 2000s. So what's going on now in, in computer vision? So uh, this is one uh, good example of work that, uh, again, was not possible 10 years ago. Uh, this is uh, work that uh, was done primarily at Microsoft Research. Um, so what they did is they uh, took uh, Picasa, uh, pick your favorite online photo archive, and they simply typed in a, uh, a keyword. So uh, you know, type in Yosemite or Half Dome or whatever your favorite keyword is. You're going to get back a few thousand photos. Now, the fact is, because of the work that we did in the 80s, understanding geometry, we now know how to take photos and relate them to each other geometrically. And we can now, with the computing available, we can do that at scale. And so what they're really doing behind the scenes is they're taking all these photos, and they're literally registering them. So I guess that's the, the Trevi Fountain. Uh, so here's all the photos at Trevi Fountain. You can see where all the photos were taken from. They're registered together. And it really gives you a, a sense of not only of where the photos were taken, but now a way to, to spatially browse through the, the images. And so it's really the beginning of, of seeing computer vision at scale, primarily enabled because of digital imaging and, and online data sources. Of course, once you can do it for uh, uh, discrete photo collections, you can do it for video. This happens to be work that we did uh, doing endoscopic reconstructions. Another new revolution is that these video sources are available uh, in many places that they weren't available before. So for example, in medicine, we can now take endoscopic video and extract information from it. So I, I wanted to point out, though, so these are, are things that are extremely well publicized uh, in the, the computer vision uh, literature. But I, I think it's important to realize that the DLR actually really, again, was there before many of us. So uh, these are 3D reconstructions that were computed from uh, aerial imagery. Uh, and they are done at a scale that really rivals or exceeds many of the, the uh, examples that you just saw. Uh, so, you know, we're constructing a fountain. This is a whole mountain. So, uh, you know, it's really uh, an incredible contribution. And what I think is interesting is it's not only uh, the, the application of the technology, which is really amazing when you start to see these 3D reconstructions, but also to realize that fundamental science came out of and drove this uh, development. Uh, so, in fact, in fact Heiko Hirschmüller uh, uh, developed the semi-global matching method, which is now widely used in computer vision, largely to be able to solve these problems. So, again, it's a contribution not just in, in what's doable, but also the fundamental science of doing it. So, in the, the few minutes I, I have left, I thought I would uh, now try to talk a little bit about where the field is really at now and where maybe it could or should be going. Uh, I, I don't have the audacity to be able to tell the future. In fact, as I've already proven, I'm very bad at it. But uh, nonetheless, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, so one of the 
fundamental uh, uh, contributions in vision that really changed the landscape was a paper by David Lowe in 1999 called Object Recognition from Local Scale Invariant Features, uh, otherwise known as SIFT features. Um, because of the development of those features, uh, suddenly a number of, of uh, capabilities were created. One was actually that registration system that I showed you early on, but another was the ability to do object recognition very effectively, essentially by memorizing many, many local thumbnails, features on an object, you were able to take specific objects, index them by their features, and now when you see the features, it's basically doing object recognition to table lookup. So, uh, you know, reducing object recognition, which you have to realize in the 90s, if you could recognize 10 objects, you were doing great, to suddenly creating it as a table lookup, where uh, by 2002, 2003, we're talking hundreds of objects, was truly a revolution uh, in the field. And what that's now driven people to do is to say, well, how far can we go with these data-intensive approaches? So in particular, can we go from recognizing specific objects, so my bicycle, my car, my coffee cup, to recognizing categories of objects? Because if you can crack the category problem, now you've got generalization. When I see a new car, I recognize it as a car. I don't have to have seen that specific car before. So there's actually a, a competition now called Pascal where they create classes of images. They try to train, uh, through machine learning techniques, classifiers that are then able to detect categories uh, of images. So some of these categories, for example, are bicycle, bird, boat, bottle, bus, car. So both rigid objects and, and deformable objects. So how are we doing at this? Well, in some categories, we're not doing too bad. So if you want to recognize a bicycle or a bus or, or a car to, to first order, um, we can get it about half the time correct. And this actually is, is, is significantly better than what it was even two or three years ago. It's, it's increasing uh, significantly. But at the same time, if we look uh, on the other side, if you want to recognize a boat or a bird, we're doing about 20%. We're really not doing much above chance. Uh, and so we're, we, this is the problem that really, at this point in the field, we're not quite sure how to proceed. But if you look at the how the field is uh, uh, evolving. If you look at, uh, this is CVPR, this is the Computer Vision Conference. Well, learning and object recognition right now is uh, greater than 100 papers uh, in the conference. That's about a third. So that's a third of the conference. Uh, so people are continuing to try these methods and to improve them. Uh, scene understanding is pretty low down. So if you're a robot and you want to understand a scene, there's 12 papers on that. There's robotics. So if you look at the computer vision community, they really are not building vision for robots. There are three papers uh, on robotics uh, in the computer vision, uh, uh, this computer vision conference. And I'll just point out, bringing up the bottom is performance evaluation. So uh, Alex just gave a great talk about how reliable systems need to be. If you're looking for reliability and uh, uh, application to robotics, the computer vision community is not uh, bringing it. Uh, it's something that we in the robotics community are going to have to, to uh, take on. So, um, so what, what is going on in vision and, and how can we kind of break out of this current uh, paradigm? So uh, I have this equation, y equals f of x. So 10 years ago, if uh, you were doing computer vision, you would have said, well, x is some model of the world and y is an image. Because what we were trying to do is we were trying to figure out how to model how images are formed, how objects appear in images, and then eventually take the images and figure out what objects are there. Today, in machine learning, it's a very different sort of setting. Y is the answer I want, and X is an image. And what I assume is you can give me lots and lots of answers paired with lots and lots of images, and eventually I'll find some function F that manages to map uh, images to the answer I want. So effectively, they're trying to solve vision as a regression problem. Uh, and you know, the, the alchemy or the art of it is, well, what do you put into F? What do you extract from images? What sort of algorithms do you use? How do you put them together to make something uh, that works? So uh, do we actually believe that's solvable? Well, one way you can think of it is this. Uh, how much data do you actually have to work with? So I mentioned Siri and, uh, and uh, uh, Watson. So the current web is about 10 to 100 petabytes of text. So that's what they had to work with to solve Jeopardy. 
or you can think of it as kind of one to 10 petawords that are out there. So it's a lot of data, a lot of words, a lot of information in principle. If you look at images, I just did the calculation, YouTube says they're getting about 35 hours of video a minute. That's about 10 billion images a year. Um, I'm guessing that 10 billion images a year is probably two to three orders of magnitude less than you would actually need to be able to solve interesting vision problems, even if what you're trying to do is to do something simple like category recognition. And part of the reason for that is if you think of the complexity of the visual world, how a single object can appear under different lighting conditions, different pose, different inclusions, uh, different instantiations of the same object, you start to realize that you've got to have something more inside that black box than a simple regression algorithm. You've got to have uh, a, a step up. So I asked um, Alex uh, uh, about the connect, and it was kind of with malice of forethought. So I think one of the big game changers that's going to happen in computer vision is, of course, the connect. If you make the analogy with sonar, I said sonar, it was really a hard sensor to work with. We didn't understand the data we were getting back. As soon as we had laser scanning, suddenly things took off. You can make the same analogy with vision. Visual images are tremendously complex. Once you have the underlying geometry, suddenly understanding images becomes much, much simpler. And so even though if you're trying to solve a vision problem, such as recognition, uh, the, uh, the recognition become much easier. I just put this up here just to give you an example. It happened to be the only Kinect video uh, I happen to have on my, my computer. It's, so you can see the sort of data that you're actually getting out of the Kinect, very clearly uh, able to, to recognize the human. Um, this is actually a video we did. Um, it, it almost went viral. It's uh, somebody running a Da Vinci, uh, Nicola Podoy actually running a Da Vinci, uh, using a, a connect, so surgery using a, a gesture-based interface. So, so I've talked a lot about information, uh, and uh, I haven't talked at all about action. So let me try to close by, by bringing us all together. So we've got vision in this state where they're trying to basically solve vision as a regression problem, uh, and I haven't talked about action at all. But we've got sensing. So uh, we've got the sensors now. We've got a very large growing archive of data. The computing, I think, is also here. Uh, we're inventing algorithms to process this information at scale, both in terms of reconstruction in terms and uh, you know, recognition. So how come we're not doing perception-based robotics? I think it's a very simple answer. I think if you look at just about any paper on computer vision, it completely ignores the physical world and interaction with the physical world. In fact, I would bet if you look, more than 50% of sensor-based robotics is really trying to keep the robot away from touching the world, you know, doing obstacle avoidance, doing navigation. So it's really like we're, we're putting the robot in a cage, or perhaps we're putting ourselves in a cage, and making sure the robot never interacts with the physical world. And I think we really need to, to re-embrace the idea that we want to do interactive and active uh, manipulation and change in the world. So this is just one example, again, recent work that we did uh, doing tactile uh, object recognition, where we take tactile sensors, we explore an object, and we're able to show that some of those ideas from SIFT and object recognition can be mapped in the tactile domain, and in fact, we can recognize objects with greater than 90% accuracy simply using tactile sensors as imaging sensors that you move across the surface, something that really does require interactivity to make it happen. So not only are robots viewing the world at a distance, but I'll bet that three quarters of the robotics papers assume the world don't change, uh, that the world is static, and I'll bet that uh, probably 99% of robotics assumes that the world is completely rigid and that it can interact with the world uh, rigidly. And I think, uh, you know, if you look at real-world scenes, it doesn't take you long to realize most of the interesting stuff in the world is non-rigid. Uh, you know, a lot of, uh, for example, people like to talk about a robot cleaning up a room. There's a messy bedroom for you. Uh, and I would say just about everything that is out of place in that room is a non-rigid object. So we need to be able to manipulate those objects. The only rigid thing in there is the bed frame and the dresser. And I'll also point out that uh, one of the things that we really want robots to be able to do is to interact with people, and people are themselves non-rigid. And we really need to understand what it means then to, to interact with deformable objects. Imagine trying to help the gentleman on the left 
you know, relatively uh, thin and uh, fit looking. If you want to help him up, how much force do you apply and how hard are you allowed to squeeze before his arm hurts? Uh, as opposed to the gentleman on the right, who obviously is heavier, will take more force, is going to be uh, more forgiving as well. So we need to have those models, uh, uh, understand those models to be able to interact effectively, not only with the world around us, but with people in the world. So <clears throat> I'm going to actually uh, suggest that one of the important things that we need to do is to, to actually go back, and uh, again, this is uh, borrowing a page uh, from Rotex, which is to, to realize that um, simulation is now a, a commodity that we can use in robotics. And in fact, we can simulate not only rigid physics, we can simulate deformable physics quite well. And so the data that we're getting really needs to be supported by these physical models that we're able to bring to bear on the problems. And the real problem we need to think about is, is not exactly what to do with the data or what to do with simulation, but how do we bring simulation and models together? Again, just to, to make a connection with DLR, here's one example of, of what we're doing. Uh, so this is a scene modeling system that uh, we put together with uh, Manuel Bruca, uh, Tim Bodenmiller, Darius Bershka, uh, Simon Leonard, and myself. And the idea is that uh, here what we're doing is building 3D scene models. The scene models actually have physics embedded in them. So when you get an image, you don't just get separate objects floating in space but you have physics that makes objects set on top of each other. Uh, objects can't intercollide. And the way that we actually verify objects are there is to synthetically render them and to say, look, if I've got the model right, the image that I render should look like the scene that I got. And that's what it means that I understand the image. I think we can push this further. You know, another example of uh, uh, being able to use simulation and modeling would be, for example, to be able to manipulate different types of objects containing liquids. Once you've been able to simulate one object containing liquids, most other objects containing liquids behave very similarly. So how do you build plans? How do you store that data? And then as you see some data from the real world, how do you index into what you already know from simulation and then take that simulation and now make it specific to that situation? So taking data, matching it to what you already know in some general sense, and then regenerating something specific for the situation in hand, I think, is at least one way that we can think about bringing the world of data and the world of physics together to actually promote and, and support action. So I'm running short of time. So I'm going to just um, kind of flip to, uh, <coughs> to the end here. Um, so one of the things that I, I also uh, I guess would advocate is I think we need to be audacious. I think one of the things we've seen through the last couple of days is uh, one of the hallmarks of the work here at DLR uh, under the leadership of Garrett has been to really do things that were audacious, you know, to, to put robots in space, to be able to telemanipulate them, to build humanoid robots that have unique uh, methods of control. So I think you need to be audacious in perception-based robotics. I think we need to think, think of you know, how do we actually build Google for the world of, of not just data, but actions and tasks that we're trying to perform. How do we take something like a, a system like Siri, which recognizes intent, and move that into the physical world? When I'm trying to cooperate with a robot, can I make it understand and recognize what I'm trying to do? Very much like that early work in force sensing that we saw uh, in some of the talks at the DLR. I think we need to, to find these audacious problems. I think the computing, the algorithms, the sensing is now there. We've got the platforms. And it's really just a question of, of our imagination. And uh, you know, if you shoot high, you never know. You might actually uh, uh, overachieve and get where you're hoping to go. So with uh, that, I thank you very much for your kind attention uh, at the end of what's been two days of wonderful but still long talks. And uh, I'll take any questions.